Hey friends, the bad science I want to talk about today isn't the usual deranged, ignorant fool you can laugh at. Now it's a bad idea that is usually presented seriously by serious people, and it drives me up the wall. I am speaking of theistic evolution. What triggered me today was an essay that expressed concern that half the students in the country think evolution is atheistic that you need to discard your belief in God to accept evolution. That, of course, is not true. Humans are adept at believing all kinds of contradictory beliefs, and I'm quite accustomed to, for instance, pre-med biology students who are enthusiastic fans of professional sports that cause frequent concussions. I'm not one to tell students that they can't possibly be a biologist unless they discard their belief in God's. You know that movie, God's Not Dead? One of the really ridiculous aspects of that movie was a professor who demanded that his students sign a statement of disbelief in gods. We don't do that. It's the antithesis of good teaching, actually. And also, chattering about metaphysics and theology is a waste of time in a science class. There is simply no debate here. But in this essay, I'll link it below, the author annoyed me from the very beginning. She points out that many of our students think they do have to be an atheist to accept evolution. She writes, does someone have to be an atheist to accept evolution? According to the philosophy of science and many science educators, the answer is no. However, my recent study has revealed that over half of college bi biology students in the United States think that in order to accept evolution fully, they would have to be an atheist. This is a challenge if we want to increase acceptance of evolution in a country where almost half the residents do not think humans evolved. Fine, okay. Although I think these students are equating atheism with a rejection of a certain narrow tenets of a particular religious dogma. Unfortunately, her solution to this misperception by students is bring more religion into the science classroom. We are supposed to accommodate the believers and reassure them that their superstition is just fine. No, this is going too far. I already accommodate my religious students enough by not engaging in time-wasting discussions of the religious implications of the science we're learning. I would simply tell them, if asked, that the Bible and the Koran are not science textbooks they have nothing to teach us about biology, and I might concede that perhaps we could learn something about human history and relationships from their holy books, but every single one of them lacks any novel or useful information about biology. I am also not happy that these kinds of essays are always exercising assumptions that atheism is a scary, horrible idea that frightens the children and scares them away from evolution. If it's scary, that's not the fault of atheism. That's a perception promoted by the religious people and by way too many well-meaning people who see a general philosophical position as a problem for education. What if, in order to accept evolution, you did have to be an atheist? Where's the tragedy in that? Do you think disbelief in gods is a tragic outcome that leads to dissolute, destroyed lives? Because it doesn't. Maybe one solution to the aversion to evolution because of a mistaken belief that it turns you into an atheist should be to teach people to be more tolerant of differences in beliefs about gods. But as always, the conversation is always about softening the implications of scientific materialism to be nice to the fundamentalists. So the author has three recommendations. The first is to teach the bounded nature of science. The bounded nature of science is the assertion that science only has the means to answer questions about the natural world using natural explanations and cannot address questions regarding supernatural phenomena. Whether someone accepts or understands the bounded nature of science might determine whether he or she considers evolution to be atheistic or agnostic. Oh boy. Shall we teach agnosticism in the science classroom then? This will not solve any of the conflicts between religion and science. Fine, tell the students that they should be agnostics. 
I guarantee you that the devout members of the local conservative Baptist church will be quite certain that you are teaching Satanism. Because, of course, if we're going to take this sensible approach and discuss the limitations of science, we'll also have to, dis have to discuss the limitations of religion. And then the explosions will begin. No thanks. I'll steer clear of those landmines, but if you tell me I must discuss the value of reassuring the evangelical Christians on the wisdom of compromise with agnosticism, I'll be ready to defend myself, because it won't be the atheists rising up in outrage at this line of thinking. Okay, is her second suggest suggestion any better? She wants us to discuss religious scientists that accept evolution. Theodosius Dobzhansky famously said in a 1973 essay that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. But what people do not usually realize is that he also argued for compatibility between religion and evolution in that very same essay. Dobzhansky was a pioneer of the modern evolutionary synthesis of evolution and genetics and was also religious. Francis Collins is director of the National Institutes of Health, NIH, in the United States and headed the Human Genome Project. A staunch defender of the importance of evolution, he's also an evangelical Christian, and he founded the organization BioLogos to promote harmony between evolution and religion. Kenneth Miller is a Catholic biologist who famously argued against the teaching of intelligent design in science classes, classes during the Kitzmiller vs. Dover trial, and wrote a book on the compatibility between his faith and evolution. Discussing these scientists can highlight where evolution and religion can be compatible and give students an opportunity to see their own religious identity reflected among authoritative scientists. No, that's not any better. You see, I don't hesitate to discuss the scientific work of Dobzhansky and Collins and Miller. I don't discuss Biologos because it does not any science to the conversation. And in fact, I don't see the point to talking about the religious belief of any of the scientists I might discuss in the classroom. Do I also need to say that Darwin was an agnostic? Or that T.H. Morgan and Stephen Jay Gould and Richard Lewinton are atheists? I notice we aren't discussing the idea of presenting brilliant atheist scientists who are renowned and successful in their fields as examples for why it is not such a terrible thing to be an atheist. Why not? Wouldn't legitimizing atheism also be a good way to reduce the conflict with evolution? Her third idea is the worst. We are supposed to discuss theistic evolution in the classroom. Theistic evolution is a belief that a supernatural deity is somehow responsible for evolution. A person can fully accept every tenet of evolution, including the common ancestry of life on earth, and still think there was somehow the work of a supernatural creator. Highlight theistic evolution as a concrete way that someone can believe in God, gods, and accept evolution. If you do not believe in God or gods, resist the urge to project your own beliefs onto evolution. Evolution is by definition agnostic rather than atheistic, and therefore both an atheistic and theistic view can be compatible with the scientific theory of evolution. Yuck. No, no way. When I teach science, I teach observation and experiment and analysis. There is no substance to theistic evolution. The deity has not been observed. It is not subject to experiment. And there ain't no data about his being to study. When I teach how mitochondria work, I talk about Peter Mitchell's chemiosmotic theory we go through the elements of the redox reactions in the membrane. We learn all about ATP synthase. We look at these cool experiments in which pH was modified or ionophores were used to remove the proton gradient. I do not then suggest that some people might come find some comfort in the idea that a god is personally directing the proton traffic. Yet for some reason, people are comfortable telling evolutionary biologists that, hey, despite the lack of evidence, just maybe there's a supernatural deity shuttling mutations around to produce the illusion of a designer. Now, I will be among the first to tell you that science is value-laden and that there are all kinds of societal biases that affect our scientific interpretations and priorities. 
But this goes all ways. All too often we have to deal with a bias that favors religious interpretations and belittles secular ideas. The secular ideas are presented as the obstacle, the problem that needs to be fixed, rather than the all-pervasive, God-soaked religiosity of our country being the significant barrier. We atheists are expected to be the ones to bend, and it's always pointless. Bending towards professing agnosticism is damn stupid. There is no conflict with agnostics. There is also no conflict with liberal religion that is willing to accept scientific ideas. I guarantee you Francis Collins and Ken Miller aren't storming into PTA meetings to curse science textbooks. The suggested ways to resolve the conflict aren't going to even touch the problem. The conservative evangelical fundamentalists who embrace creationism will not be appeased by A, encouraging more agnostic perspective, B, highlighting a few people who, define, who combine Christianity and evolution, who are all probably going to hell anyway, and C, whispering a few mealy-mouthed platitudes about theistic evolution, which the problematic religions all reject anyway. I also have to point out that all the waffly talk about agnosticism is not only going to be ineffectual, it's operationally false. It is literally true that science has to be agnostic on the matter of gods because we can't say for sure that there isn't some cosmic intelligent being rattling around in the woodwork. However, we can say that all the religions that people actually practice that make claims about the nature and history of the material universe are false. They're wrong that I don't use the science classroom to trumpet that news to my students isn't because I'm unsure, but because it is entirely irrelevant to the subject at hand. As usual though, this particular problem in educating people about science is blamed on the atheists rather than the ignorant conservative religious folk who are fed a steady diet of malicious propaganda. Just once, I'd like to see one of those sociological studies try not to see atheism as the problem, but rather that the entirety of the conflict is resting on the dogma of certain religions. <sighs> okay, gang, I'll stop the ranting there. I'm not planning to talk about the atheist perspective here very much because I've been burned by a few too many clueless atheists who use their philosophy to justify way too many awful social biases. However, through it all, I am still an adamant atheist who isn't going to stand by while someone tries to tell me I have to use religious apologetics as a didactic technique. I'm not going to. So today I'm going to let you watch the news of my patrons scroll by on a background consisting of all the scientific evidence for any gods at all. Look closely or you might miss it.